Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Rowland. I'm president of your Stoddard County Farm Bureau Board of Directors. And on behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome everybody to our 2018 Meet the Candidate meeting. At this time, fair one, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight we have uh, multiple candidates up here asking for your vote, and we're pleased to have each and every one of them here. We're pleased to have every one of you here to come here and get informed on your vote and ask them these people questions. Uh, one of the major things coming up at the August primary is the uh, propositions one and two. And tonight from the Sheriff's Department, we have Mr. Andy Holden here to uh, brief you on, uh, give you an explanation on everything that's gonna go on with that. So, Mr. Holden. Well, I wanna thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, generally, the Sheriff has been giving this presentation Unfortunately, he's out of town, so that left me, y'all get to listen to me tonight. Um, I put a lot of this information together. Um, you can see I come up here, I don't have any notes. I'm just going by what I know, what I've worked with over the last 20 years. Um, give you a little background on myself. I started up there, been right at 20 years ago. Um, started out as a patrol deputy, um, worked my way up, worked investigations. A couple of years ago, Carl come to me after Tommy Horton retired asked me to be his chief deputy, and I have been ever since. Um, we've been battling an issue up there at the jail for years. This is not something that happened overnight. This has been coming for a long time. We've seen it coming. Um, it's just one of those things that nobody wants to address. Um, but we're to the point now we've got to address this. And what this is, like I said, it's, it's a tax proposal. This is a sales tax. This is not a property tax. It's a sales tax. There's, there's two propositions on the ballot, and it's called Proposition 1 and Proposition 2. Um, and I'll get in depth and explain a little bit more as I go through this. Basically, Proposition 1 is funding that we need at the Sheriff's Office for our operations. That can include any salaries, any equipment, vehicles, uh, anything we need at the Sheriff's Office, whether it's building maintenance, whatever it may be. Uh, proposition 2 is a half cent sales tax for an addition to our current jail as well as a remodel in our current jail. Um, as you'll see here in just a couple of minutes, we're uh, extremely overcrowded. Um, a lot of people's not so concerned about the overcrowding issue, but it's costing you all the taxpayers more money. The, the more overcrowded we get, the more it's costing you for medical bills, increased manpower, taking people to the hospital, things like that. Um, Anyhow, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. 1983, they built the first building that we're in, still up there currently. Um, it housed eight inmate cells, an isolation cell, one shower, one padded cell, a holding cell, a visiting area, a booking area. When they built that, it was 3,200 square feet. At the time, it cost $376,000 to build. If we had to build that again today, it cost a little over a million dollars. In 1991, they put an addition on that. <clears throat> it gave us four more cells, another shower, a female cell block, a dispatch area, a booking room, an actual sheriff's office, a laundry room, and an observation cell. Okay, at the end of 91, uh, that jail was built to house 28 inmates. That's currently the jail that we're operating in today. There's been no other additions to that. That's what we're still in today. Um, in 1998, after the, after the 91 edition, in 1998, this is as far back in the statistics as I could go, our total daily inmate population, or average daily inmate population was 34 inmates. So we was over capacity in 1998. It was 121% capacity in 98. 
In 2016 and 2017, our average daily inmate count was 76. That's 271% capacity. 76 people in a 28 bed jail, that's an average. We've had as high as 101 people in that jail. When I left up there a little after four o'clock while ago, we had 88 inmates, 88 in a 28 bed facility. 26 of those were females. Our female population, inmate population has grown just unbelievably, which has caused an, uh, its own issue in itself. The problem we have is we got four people sleeping in a two-man cell. Those cells are designed for two people. By state and federal regulations, they tell you two people can be in this cell and they tell you how many square feet those pe two people are, are required to have. But we can't do that. We have to put up to four people in these cells. So that means two people get bunks, two people sleeping in the floor. Um, there's what's called day rooms. Now day rooms are rooms that when they get out of their cell, they're supposed to be able to go to these rooms. And all they, they have uh, metal tables and chairs that's bolted to the floor. They can't hurt their cell phone unless they fall on them. But that's supposed to be a little recreation time for them where they can watch TV, sit and visit, whatever. The law says we have to have those rooms and they have to be available to the inmates. Now the problem is, we, we're so overcrowded, we've had to move bunks into the day rooms. So the rooms that the people are supposed to get out into and at least move a little bit, get out of their 10 by 10 or 8 by 10 cell, is now everybody else's bedroom. Uh, the kitchen, <clears throat> when they designed that jail in, in 91, they didn't give us a kitchen. We had to take a holding cell and turn that into a kitchen. Now, I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. The laundry room. We use residential washers and dryers up there. If you just stop and think about how much laundry is generated by 88 inmates, all of the mattresses, all of the, the bed sheets, all of the underwear, all of the socks, all of the shirts, all of the uniforms, those, uh, those washers and dryers, they run 24-7. We usually go through about one to two sets of those a year. Because they're residential, we can't fit a commercial washer and dryer through the door where they go. They just, they physically won't fit. Um, we don't have a place for dry food storage. 20 years ago, whenever I started, we had four or five females at a time. We actually took one of the two female cell blocks and that was our dry food storage. So we could keep our dry food in the jail. Well, all of our female population has grown so much, we've had to take that back over as a cell block. We actually went, the county went and bought a, one of these little portable warehouse things, set it out back. That's our dry food storage. I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. Um, the cold food storage. Again, when they took this cell, this holding cell, and made it the kitchen, they actually done some remodeling in there. Um, but when they did, they built the room around the cooler for the cold food storage. Well, a few years ago when that went bad, they couldn't get that cooler out. They physically had to go in there, cut that in half the Sawzall and take it out. Well, when we got ready to put the new one in, guess what? It wouldn't go back in the room. So they're sitting in a hallway, cluttering a hallway up, which causes another problem. You can't get down the hallway if somebody has a back injury or neck injury, EMS can't get up there to get them on a cot to take them out, as well as a fire hazard. There's chronic plumbing issues. The, the plumbing and the electrical in that jail is just, it's just shot. It's, it's a 30 year old building, it's just wore out. It needs to be remodeled. The way that jail was designed, there's no direct supervision from the corrections officers to the inmates. Current jails are designed with a central location where somebody can sit and visibly, visibly see all of the inmates. This, this jail 30 years ago wasn't designed like that. There's no place for us to store our 
uniforms, mats, shoes, they're just on a rack in the hallway, right by the freezers, and you'll see a picture of that here in a minute. We only have one padded cell. Now, a padded cell is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a rubber room, and it's for people who's violent, mentally ill, or intoxicated. You can't put those people out in general population with 25 or 30 other people because either they're going to get assaulted or they're going to assault somebody. So if somebody's violent or somebody's intoxicated, that's where they go when they come in. Well, we get more than one of those in at a time a lot of times. We have to stack them in there. Um, the booking area. Everything goes through that booking area. And I'll show you some, some pictures here in a minute. All of the, the traffic going to court, people coming in to register, people getting booked in. We have no waiting area uh, to house people while they're being booked in. We, we physically chain them to the wall because that's all we've got. This uh, design company that come down out of Kansas City and started working with us on this, he walked through our jail. He said, you know, he said, this is an old jail. He said, y'all are cramped for space. He said, but I got to give it to you. He said, because you've used every square inch of space that you possibly can in this jail. And we have. We've just done what we had to do to get by. This is one of the day rooms I was talking about. You can see the tables in there. It's kind of hard to see, but even moving bunks in, people are still sleeping in the floor just because we don't have enough bunks. This is the female cell block. You can see the, the ladies down here at the bottom. There's nowhere you, if somebody gets off that top bunk, they cannot step on that floor because it's solid mattresses and people laying in the floor. There's another picture of the female cell block. You can just see them lined up here. Now, they're inmates. I understand that. But the problem this is causing is people get stepped on, people fight, causes assaults, causes us to have to take them to the hospital. Well, when they go to the hospital, guess who's paying that hospital bill? You all the taxpayers are paying that. So even if you don't care about the inmates, this laid out on the floor, I understand that, but it's still costing you all more money because you all are paying that bill to take these folks to the hospital. Now this is a hard picture to see, but this lady actually had to use the restroom in the middle of the night. She couldn't even get, she couldn't walk on the floor to get to the restroom. She walked over the table. And we've had this happen a lot. We just actually ha have happened to catch this lady on camera. What happens is, and we've had it happen several times, they'll walk over this table and they'll slip and they'll fall and fall on somebody, which causes a fight, or they'll break an arm, break a leg, break an ankle. You all are paying for all of that. Part of this issue is the trustees. Okay, trustees are inmates who do all of the cooking, all of the cleaning, all of the laundry at the jail. That jail couldn't operate without trustees. They're just inmates that we feel that we can get out of their cells to do these things that we can trust a little more than the next guy. The trustees have got to exit the building to go out and get the dry food. A lot of times we don't have enough corrections officers on to supervise them as they go out to get that food. And again, our overcrowding leads to jail assaults, increased medical cost, manpower, transporting people to the hospital. We have no way to segregate violent inmates. We have one maximum security cell in that entire facility. And if you think out of 88 people there's only one violent person in there, you're wrong. And what they do is they fight. They steal, they fight. We have to separate those people because again, it's costing you all more money. We don't enjoy sitting at the hospital with them, but if they ask to go to the hospital, we have to take them. Insult, assaults on staff. We have had corrections officers severely beaten up there because there's one jailer on, there are try, two people come in to be booked in. We've had corrections officers get jumped, severely beaten. 
it's just it's a bad situation. They don't have a cell to lock them in. Is they only book one in at a time. Escape risk. We've had people escape up there. It's just a uh, it's an old building. It was not the best design. Probably it may have been 30 years ago, but it's not that. It's not now. Um, those cell doors are open and closed so much. They're the motors will not work. They have electric motors that slide those doors back and forth. Well, they're getting to where they won't work. And we can't even buy parts for them anymore. This is what we've had to resort to, a chain and a padlock. Now, in a perfect world, that corrections officer should be standing in a secure location, flip a lever, that door should open up, and the inmate that they're calling out should come out. Now. That corrections officer has to go down there, physically put a key in a padlock, and that room that you're seeing back behind here, that's got about 15, 20 people in it. If they want to over, overpower that corrections officer, they can. They can take his keys, they can take that chain and padlock, now they got a weapon, and if they want to, they can let everybody in that jail out. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm telling you, we're living on borrowed time, it's gonna happen. You look at, this is the front of the jail, and I know it's hard to see, especially if you're sitting in the very back. You see these dark spots? All of this is glass, glass blocks. These dark spots, those blocks have actually broken. When we get a storm, a lot of times we, those glass blocks will break on the inside. When they break on the inside, they fall down. This is the inside of the cell blocks. When that glass falls down in there, now the inmates have shards of glass to make knives with. The reason they're falling out is because it's a 30-year-old building. The mortar is just deteriorated. We try to fix them as we can, but we can't fix all of them. This is the inside looking up at the glass block. And it, again, it's hard to see, but these are shards of glass that, I mean, we try to catch them when we can, you know, before the inmates get to them, but we don't always. These keys are what opens and closes a lot of the doors. Not all of the doors are electric, but these keys have been in and out of those locks so many times the tumblers are wore out. We can't buy the keys, we can't buy the tumblers. There's nobody makes this type of equipment anymore. This is one of the hallways. This is a, a gentleman about my size standing in the hallway. You can see He's touching both sides. This is one of the coolers that we couldn't get back in the kitchen. This is going back toward a cell block. EMS can't get a cot down through there. Just physically cannot. Medication. People in our jail, if they're not on medication when they come to jail, they get on medication shortly thereafter. It takes our corrections officers three to four hours to dispense all this medication. So while they're dispensing medication, everything else is getting neglected. So if you've got one guy on, or possibly two if we're lucky. If we're real lucky, we've got two corrections officers on. Well, there's still 80 plus inmates in that jail. They're criminals. They, that's all they do is think about bad things to do. And if you don't think that they can't find a time to do something bad while you're dispensing medicine, they do. This, I know again, it's hard to see on this, this picture here. This is a shower unit. That is a metal shower unit that is just absolutely falling apart. There's only three showers in that entire jail for 88 people. Three showers. They get a shower every other day. And when they get showers, it's an all-day process. They just got to take turns. It's one-man showers is what those are. This is the ceiling in that shower unit. You know what this is? It's black mold. Now it's bad enough that the inmates are in there, but my corrections officers, who's just down there making 10, 50 an hour, trying to make a living for their family, is breathing this as well. This is the padded cell I was telling you about. This is the rubber room. These walls are lined with rubber if you can beat your head on that wall, it's not, it may give you a headache, but you're not going to hurt yourself. 
But what I'm showing you here, this hole in the floor, that's where they use the bathroom. Now this is the way this cell is designed. But this drain hole, the plumbing underneath this floor has come apart. Several years ago, this, this plumbing come apart, water, sewer water was standing underneath that cell. The floor actually collapsed. We called a company in, they come, sawed the concrete out, fixed it. Guess what? It's right back like that again today. Sewer water standing underneath that floor. This is our kitchen. This was the holding cell that was turned into a kitchen. Now this was a, I think it was a 10 by 10 room, but by the time you take the stove out, the shelf out, the sink out, they've got a five foot by six foot working area. Now you can see we served 82,992 meals out of that little bitty kitchen last year. That's just phenomenal. There's no fire suppression. There's a vent hood, but there's no fire suppression. We've had trustees get burnt, severe burns, had to go to the barns in St. Louis. Again, you all are paying for all that. It's just because it's not, it's not an industrial kitchen. It's not designed to do what we're trying to do, but that's all we've got. This is the, this is the dry food storage. Now, this has been working for us for a long time, but the problem is, you can see, this is right out behind the jail. There is a chain link fence around here. The issue is, we have people come up at night, they throw contraband over that fence, and when those trustees go out to get food out of there, if they're not supervised, they're picking up that contraband, whether it's marijuana, methamphetamine, or Lord knows what else, and they're bringing it back into our jail. Now, if they can throw a little bit of dope over that fence, they could very easily throw a, a knife or a gun over that fence. Now it's in our jail. That's a big problem. This is our laundry. Again, this is our residential washers and dryers. So we go through one to two sets of those a year. This is our property storage. When people are brought into jail, they're all wearing clothes. We have to keep their clothes. Well, we got to where we didn't have a place to put it. We had so many people, we didn't have a place to store it. So we took over this room, which is supposed to be our IT room for the sheriff's office. It houses our computer network system, our phone system. Well, we had to take that room over and now store inmate property in there. So when our IT guy has to come up and work on the computers or, or network, he's got to work his way around behind all of this to get back in here to work on that and this room smells horrendous. This is the control system for the doors when they work properly, which they don't very often, um, but the corrections officer should be standing outside here, flip those levers, open whatever door he wants to open. This is a site for the new jail, which is right behind. It'll be the, the new addition is planned to be connected to the old building. This is another picture looking at the back of our current jail. The plans call for a renovation of the existing jail as well as an updated the current sales and operating system. Uh, dispatch enlargement. Um, we're going to move some some move some rooms around I'll show you here in a minute to create more bed space in our current jail. Um, as you see here, and I know some of y'all sitting in the back, it's hard to see, and, and after I'm done, after everybody else is done, if you want to come up and look at some of these plans, I'll be glad to sit and, and talk to you and show you. Uh, but this is a, our, our largest cell block that we currently have. It's called A and B block. Um, the new design plans are to demo that out, put two dormitory style living spaces in there for our nonviolent inmates. Currently, when we go pick somebody up, if it's some little 17, 18 year old kid that you know, maybe hasn't done a whole lot wrong, but maybe he's got a warrant, we're forced to arrest him, we're mandated to arrest him. But when we bring him to jail, we have no way to segregate him. He goes right in the pot with all of the felons, all of the career criminals, who's, that's all they've done all their life is in and out of prison. Well, that's not a good situation for that little 17-year-old kid. It may be a good lesson for him, 
but there's no telling what he's going to learn while he's up there. But this, like I said, this, this is does, what we're looking at now is to make a dormitory style setting for low, lower level offenders that maybe don't cause so many problems that can live in a dormitory setting. Um, the new addition will be constructed with full basement. Uh, a lot of the operations will be down there, our, our main booking room, some of the holding cells, isolation cells, things like that. Our uh, kitchen, laundry, uh, all the mechanical stuff will be housed down in the basement. Uh, the main level, the main level of construction is going to be what they call a pod system. Uh, and it's kind of like if, if you can imagine um, a corrections officer will be sitting in the center and, and out from each, uh, from this center, there, there's a pod that houses inmates. And he has visual supervision of, of all of these inmates. Uh, and it's, it's a two-tier system. Um, it's called a, a mezzanine style. And when we initially started this project late last year, early this year, uh, they told us to get with a design design company. He said, uh, "Make you a jail. Tell this tell this uh, architect what you need, and he'll he'll draw you a jail." And we did. They didn't give us any any uh, anything to say. No, don't do this or don't do that. Well, we come back. We had a 120 bed jail, and it was 13 million dollars. County commission said, whoa, "Whoa, that's too much money. Shrink that down a little bit. Lower the bed space." So we did. We shrunk it down. We we moved some stuff around. Um, we went from 120 beds down to 82, 84 beds, down to nine million dollars, which is what we're currently at. We got a new design group involved um, with that 80 some beds. They redesigned some stuff. Now we're back up to 120 beds at the same price. 120 beds for nine million. This is the the pod system that I'm talking about. Your con corrections officer sits in the center, um, and he has visual line of sight to all of these inmates. Now, to save these beds, what we've done was all of this will be constructed, but this pod, this pod, and this pod will be what they call shell space. These cells are modular cells. Um, in the future, we need to add another 15, 20 beds. There will be a panel that can come out of this wall here. These cells are precast, pre-made. They slide them in that hole, hook the, hook the sewer, the water, and electrical up. They're good to go. We believe with this tax that we're asking for that there will be enough left over to put back for this future expansion. We're, we're not wanting to come back and ask anybody 10 years down the road for more money. That's not what we're wanting to do. As well as we're hoping that if we have the extra bed space, we're contacted all the time by other counties asking us to house their inmates um, at $30, $40 a day. You know, if you had 20, 20 inmates at $30, $40 a day, that's a little over $200,000 that could be put back in this jail for future expansion. We believe that at the end of this project, if this goes through, if we get these taxes passed, get this jail built, um, that's going to meet our needs for several years to come, probably as long as I'm around anyhow. Now, like I explained, the, the funding, it's going to be $9 million is what this addition is going to cost. And it's going to be funded from a half cent, one half of 1% sales tax for seven years. After that seven years, that tax is going to sunset. It's going to go away. It won't be any more. That is Proposition 2. Uh, proposition 1, again, is the funding for all of the operations. Proposition 1 has to pass before two can pass. Two can't pass and not one. The reason being is they don't want to go out here and build a $9 million jail and no way to fund it. It makes perfect sense to me. We want to make sure we got the funding to operate the jail, then we'll 
proceed with, with building the jail. Proposition one is also going to be used to increase salaries for new employees. Currently, my corrections and my dispatch start at $10.50 an hour. My road deputies, their base pay is $11.62 an hour. If you look at some of these other figures at surrounding agencies, we are the second lowest paid agency, law enforcement wise, in Stoddard County, only to Puxico Police Department. It's the only one that pays less than us. Stoddard County is the 10th largest county, 827 square miles, 950 miles of roadway, almost 30,000 people. We at the Sheriff's Office, we average about 11,000 calls for service a year. That equates to a little over 30 calls a day that my deputies are responding to. If you break it down, if you take all of the municipalities in Stoddard County that have police departments, there's about 35 municipal officers. Now, if you total their city populations up, that's about 14,000 people. So you've got one officer for every 400 people. Okay, the Sheriff's Office, we got seven road deputies. That's all we got, seven. Those seven road deputies are servicing 16,000 people. That's one deputy for two th every 2,285 people. Uh, back to Proposition 1. Proposition 1, a half cent sales tax in Stoddard County is projected to generate $1.4 million a year. Our current budget this year was $1.2 million. De Dexter Police Department, and I'm not picking on Dexter, I love Dexter, I wish they had a $5 million budget. They're operating on a $2 million budget and they're not running a jail that's got almost 90 people in it. All of those 90 inmates, they gotta be fed every day. They, they've got laundry that's done. They, you know, I mean, there's, it's just continuous. This is the verbiage of Proposition 1. It's not tricky, it's straightforward. I mean, it, it is what it is. It's one half of 1% for the purpose of maintaining Sauter County Jail and Sheriff's Office operations. That's what it is. Proposition two is one half of 1% for a period of seven years uh, from, from the date on which the tax is first imposed for the purpose of renovation of the existing jail, construction, equipment, and design cost of the jail addition. And again, it says collections for this proposition are not to begin until the one half of 1% the sales tax from Proposition 1 is approved. So if we don't pass one, we can't get two. Um, I've got these drawings up here if anybody wants to come and see them. That's where we're at, folks. Uh, I know I'll run through it pretty quick because I know everybody else wants to talk to these folks. Uh, we're going to, yes, sir. expense of someone that's living right and working to make a living. When I was in Georgia in the Army in 1965, I got falsely accused of speeding. They put me in the orange coverall to go out on the road, and they had these colored ladies cooking three meals a day, oatmeal, cornmeal, no meal. And I'll tell you what, you never want to go back to that jail. I think this will double the amount of trouble that we got now. I don't know what the answer would be, but I think we can be, take too good a care of these people. I know you need safety. I'm yes, not sir. arguing that point in any way. My, my main concern is not necessarily a place for these inmates to sleep. My main concern is the safety for my corrections officers that's having to work in this jail. It's not safe. It's not safe for their health. It's not safe for their safety as far as being assaulted. And you're absolutely correct. It can be too nice. I can tell you, we feed our prisoners for a dollar and seven cents a meal. It costs the juvenile office four over four dollars a meal to feed the juveniles. We're feeding our people for a dollar and seven cents. I ought to help them straighten out. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. This is your chance, folks. Yes. Hey, I'm open to any questions. I'll, I'll do my best to answer any question that anybody has. 
Excuse me? That, that option's been explored. Um, actually, I've had that question at other presentations. We have, Carl and I have been giving this for weeks now. Um, people ask, why don't you tear down and start new? Well, the problem is, what are we gonna do with 80 or 90 inmates while we tear down the jail that we're in? We're gonna have to house them somewhere. Build it somewhere else. I understand that. The, the problem with that is, is the logistics getting our inmates back and forth to court. Um, I don't know in the long run if you're going to spend more money hiring more people to drive buses and vans because we're constantly going back and forth to court. Now, we walk them to court. If we build on off-site, we're going to we're going to have to buy some buses or some vans of some sort to haul them continuously back and forth to court. We looked at housing some inmates over in uh, Mississippi County. We got our, our jail population got pretty high. Went to the commission, said, hey, we need, to, we need some relief. Can we house some inmates in Mississippi County? They said, sure. So we loaded up, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 of them took them over there. I think that lasted about six weeks. We spent uh, a little over $100,000. And it was a logistics nightmare because you would no more get a busload to court and the one they needed at court was still in Mississippi County. So that, that would go on constantly. I understand, I understand. I can't answer, I didn't make the decision to build it there, that's the county commission. I just work with what I, what they decide. That may be a, a better question for them. Isn't there another location close to the courthouse that you can uh, build a new jail? You wouldn't have to tear the open down. I, I don't know of any available property around there. Again, that may be a, a, a question for one of the commission, current commissioners to answer. Um, you know, I know there's the county farm. It's a little ways just right outside of Bloomfield. But again, that's going to get back into, you know, the logistics of moving people you know back and forth to court I, I understand your concern and and we have looked at that anybody else yes what we have agreed upon and again when we started this uh, the commission said, you know, I think it would be a good idea to go into a memorandum of understanding. So you know what's expected of us. We know what's expected of you to do with this tax money. So I sat down and I wrote one up. Well, come to find out from Mr. Oliver, we can't do that. The sheriff's office can't enter into an agreement with the county commission. No county office holder, am I correct, Russ? Legally, we can't, we can't enter into an agreement. Is that correct? Okay. That's what we found out. So we're back to all well, we've got to our word. All we've got is their word on what they're going to do. We've got our word on what we're going to do. But what we agreed upon, there was, there was nothing hard set. We didn't want them, this 1.4 million tax money to come in and them say, well, this 1.2 that you was getting, uh, we're going to take that away. So we're only gonna have a $200,000 windfall. That's, that's not gonna solve our problem. So what we come up with and, and agreed upon pretty much was they're gonna continue paying 50% of whatever salaries we have. So it, it still holds, holds the commission to using some general revenue dollars as well as us using some, some of our money. Yes, anybody? State assistance, SSI, Medicaid, Medicare. Yep. Does any of that go to pay their uh, medical bills in the county bill? The minute they walk into our jail, the minute they they're brought into our jail, any assistance, state assistance they get stops. So any Medicaid, Medicare, SSI, any of that is stopped. Now the day they're convicted and they're sent on to prison, all that's reinstated. Is that 
state statute? <laughs> I'm assuming it's, it's some type of regulation with with the state. Yes, yes. I, I don't I'm know. Just asking, is that a law passed by the by the legislature? I'm sure it is. I don't, I don't know the the statute number of it, but I, I know they don't have any state assistance coming in when they're in our jail. Yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, those please ask them this is what this is, this is for get you all informed and folks i'm sure i probably didn't think of everything that needs to be said here tonight so if you've got something that you wondering why i didn't mention it it's probably because i forgot it because i don't give this speech all the time the sheriff's been doing it so if you've got a question ask anybody anybody up here when you talked earlier Another presentation I heard with regards to what happens if somebody files a lawsuit or the state comes in and decides to shut us down. What oh, absolutely. Uh, we have one insurance company in the United States that will even insure Sauter County because of the jail. And if they come in and says, you know what, we're not going to insure you this year because of the conditions of this jail, we're going to be just like New Madrid County. New Madrid County had to shut their jail down. I think they're paying somewhere close to $1.5 million a year to house their prisoners in Pemiscott County. That's, that's what we're looking at. Here go. If, as long as I'm on the commission, and I think as long as Carol's on the commission, any money that we can put to retire this debt faster, left over out of the one point two million, we're going to try to accelerate and pay this jail off. We're not going to try to spend money where it's not necessary. This should have been addressed a long time ago, and I'm not going rocks and past commissioners. This is something that should have been addressed a little bit of a long, a little bit as we went along, instead of letting it get where it's got. What about video? What? what about video as opposed to uh, transporting the prisoners uh, personally? Do we, do we not have a video uh, conferencing com uh, ability? Currently, no. Why not? Is that a we have no room in the jail for it. These new plans, we've got no, a room no, for No, I mean, uh, legally, I'm... under the uh, RSMOs, are you, uh, is it legal to do so? Yes, yes, Just they can do video so. arraignments, I believe. Um, don't have a facility, that's what you're saying. We don't have a room to okay. take them to to do that. Now, these new plans, they, they've actually got a room. We can do video arraignments. We won't have to take them to the court every time. Now, after the first arraignment, I believe they're, they're mandated to go to the court, but that's going to cut down a lot of the traffic back and forth. But we, we can't do it. Um, I did forget something. Let me back up just a minute. Go back to my deputies. Um, I did forget to hit on this. We've had a great turnover this year with our deputies. Um, I think we've lost upwards of four or five of our road deputies. Um, we're slowly building back up. It's hard to hire these guys telling them they're going to pay $11.62 an hour. It's hard to hire people especially deputies that we hope are going to stick around because when we invest money in them, training, we want them to stay, but they're not staying. We're hiring people, they're getting trained, and they're moving on to other places because they're paying more money. I don't blame them. I don't blame them a bit. $11.62 an hour is what I tell my guys they're going to be making base pay when they go to work for me. You get a week's vacation after your first year. You get two weeks of vacation after your second year. And I don't think it goes up again until your 10th year. Do they get to take it? Generally, no. These guys, they're, we're so short-handed, they have vacation built up that they can't take or won't take because they don't want to leave the guy they're working with by himself. You leave one guy takes a vacation, we're going to have to call somebody in who's scheduled to be off, pay them overtime, 
or one guy's got to work by himself and cover 827 square miles. It's just, it's not a good situation. If Proposition 1 passes, does that uh, take, will that take care of all the budget for the Sheriff's Office or will it still to some come out of the general revenue? Some will still come out of general revenue. That's what the 50% of the salaries will still come out of general revenue. That's all we're asking for, at least, is just some help. Um, but we feel with the 50% of the salaries coming out of general revenue and this 1.4, uh, you know, it's, it's not a fix-all, but it's, it's sure going to help us way on down the road. Just to, just to help us buy the equipment we need. The last two years, the commission, uh, I've asked for, for vehicles. You know, our vehicles are, are aging. Um, we've got vehicles that's out on the road that's 160, 180,000 miles. They're out here running code with those vehicles. Uh, this year alone, I've replaced three transmissions and vehicles at $4,000 a piece because the commission says they don't have the money to give us to buy new, new vehicles. You know, that's where we're at. This tax would alleviate that. We could get, years ago, we got on a rotation where we got two new vehicles a year. That got our rotation where we was getting rid of our vehicles when they had about 120 to 140,000 miles on, which is not bad. You know, they're, they're still mechanically sound, but yet they're not out here running code going down the highway. Um, but we got in the rotation. The last two years, we've not. Now, last year, I worked on a grant. I worked on a grant for 12 months to get two vehicles from USDA. And thanks to USDA, we did get a grant. Two vehicles, we got $14,000. It wasn't a drop in the bucket. And we had to wait a year to get those. But, I mean, we're, we're trying everything we can try, but we just don't know what other band-aid to put on this dam at this point. Have y'all applied for grants for, to help build this? I'm not aware of any outstanding grants to build the facility. Um, during one of our presentations, we was contacted by uh, one of the local pastors who actually offered and said, hey, you're going to have these three shelled out spaces. Would you all be interested in setting up, let me, let me just send a counselor up there and get some substance abuse counseling going on? Sure. It's open space. We can set some tables up there. We can now have some in-house counseling possibly. Um, there may be some grant money for some of that stuff. I don't know. I hope there is. We get this sales tax pass, we're going to look into stuff like that. Yes? I talked to Carla Jacobs the other day. The opioid grant has changed a little bit now out into substance abuse. So we think we're going to be able to maybe set up on the pods and use it for substance abuse and counseling, maybe on top of the, the church counseling. We don't know. We're just kicking rocks and trying to, trying to do the best we can do. This is a true need, folks. This is not anything. This is no pie in the sky. This this is something that needs to be done for the safety of the officers. We've got one of the safest counties around. Do we want to keep it one of the safest counties? Because the criminals are going to hear that we don't have the help, and they're going to be coming in, and they have kept us safe, but it's getting harder and harder for them to do. With, with 88 people up there in jail, if I were to go out on a call tonight, and I had two people that was causing a problem. And maybe both of those people really needed to go to jail to solve the problem for the night. But I know if I, I can't take both of those because I'm probably going to be going to call right after this one that maybe somebody else needs to go to jail. So we're almost having to pick and choose the really, really bad people to take to jail. And we're leaving the eh, not, not so bad, but they're still out vic victimizing you folks. They're still stealing from you. They're, they're damaging property. We just don't have a place to lock them up. 
We don't have a place to put them. done I'll stay as late as I need to if somebody has a question wants to come talk one-on-one -on -one, I, I welcome you to come and ask any question you wish just I'll be thank you all okay now with that fresh on our mind we're going to uh, start at the far end of the table with our presiding commissioners that are running we will elect a new presiding commissioner this year and uh, we have first up, Mr. Jeffrey Riddle. By the way, we'll give everybody else up here about 10 minutes to talk, and then we'll take questions. And after that, we'll give you about a two-minute closure. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Like I said, my name is Jeff Riddle, and I want to be your next Stoddard County Presiding Commissioner. I'm a lifelong resident of Stoddard County. I'm a member of the Dexter Fire Department for the past 25 years. I, own, I have emergency response background. I own my own environmental business, so I know what it takes to keep up with a growing business and the daily challenge it takes to run one. And I think the county should be run like a business. 18 years ago, Stoddard County passed a sales tax to fund the county offices. The county budgets about $6 million a year with money going in and out. And a county commissioner's job is budget and finance. You don't do a budget for this year, you do a budget for the next 10 years to see where your money is going, where it's been. I think the county has around 50 employees. Out of the county sales tax money, which is 1%, out of that 1%, they fund the county offices, salaries, maintenance, upkeep of the county. They pay uh, the Justice Center and the government building is all paid for. But I believe we should back Andy and Carl in the sheriff's office. They've done a good job with what they've had to do with, which was not very much. But we need to pass Proposition 1 and 2 to give them the money they need for one, to hire, retain as employees and equipment needed to protect and serve each citizen of Stoddard County. And that's you in here tonight. Stoddard County is the 10th largest county in Missouri, like Andy said, out of 114, uh, with 128 square miles, and I've got 28,000 residents. And each resident in Stoddard County has a voice. And another top priority of mine is bridge road and bridges. You don't want your kids out on these school buses and farm equipment going down these county roads that the bridges are unsafe. And MoDOT gives the county a list of people, I mean a list of bridges that they know that's unsafe and they get with the townships and replace them. I want to see Stoddard County grow and prosperous as a community so that our children graduating from our county schools will continue to live, work, and raise their families here in Stoddard County. I think I'm the only candidate with the federal NIMS and ICS training. NIMS is National Instant Management System, and ICS is Instant Command System, which are required to work with federal and state agencies in the event of a disaster. Like I said, my name is Jeff Riddle. My number is 820-2020. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be glad to answer them. Yes, sir. I've been, going, I've been going to the county commissioner meeting since I filed the vote, and they've talked about that. And there's no ordinances in any other county around on anything like that. So, I mean, that would have to be addressed, you know, with each and every county. But as of right now, there's none in any other counties. I think Carol and Steve have done research on that. So you just have to address it on each individual issue, I think. Anything else? I would like to say one question to the gentleman over here. On this new jail, I believe we should build it on the county farm. And I think we should put the prisoners out there growing a garden and make them grow their own vegetables to save money. And make them do teleconference, like Mr. Howard said, back and forth. And make them save money on food. I'm a firm believer of that. 
Yes, sir. If you have a fence around it, you will have no problems. Pemiscot's the poorest county in Missouri, and they've got a, the best jail system around. But they house prisoners from other counties and make money. Stoddard County has, could house some prisoners. And I think there's some federal grants out there. If you would build that jail to house federal prisoners, it would cost a lot more money, but you might could get some grant money. I think the county needs to have somebody out there writing grants and checking for grants every day. I don't know who does that. Anybody else? Chris? Huh? You have any other comments? No, sir. Okay. Next up is actually former commissioner, Mr. Danny Talkington. I'm Danny Talkington, and I want to thank Farm Bureau for hosting this event and Church of Christ for allowing us to use their facility. Uh, my background, for some of you that may not know, uh, 28 years in the manufacturing uh, world from California to North Carolina, Mobile, Alabama to Sykeston, Missouri. I uh, held various positions in management from uh, accounting as a controller to president of the company. And in all of those years, my major function had to deal with uh, doing budgets, preparing the budgets, analyzing the budgets on a monthly basis, and then turning around and making sure we stayed within budget. Uh, the farming aspect came in for 19 years. Uh, in addition to uh, doing farming. I was also doing uh, tax and auditing work with a local CPA firm. And during, so you look at the number of years, you say, well, you couldn't be that old. Well, some of that was two jobs at a time. And then, as a guy reminded me the other day, part of that was three jobs when I was the county commissioner for District 1, which is in the North End. Steve now has that uh, position. During the time on the commission, we built or approved to build 11 bridges in Stoddard County. And we did it from Elk Township to Duck Creek to Pike Township. I think we actually started in Pike uh, with those bridges. Uh, we did have one bridge that washed out in the floods from 2009 that was eventually completed in uh, Castor Township and the delay on that was FEMA. We never started one bit of work on it till FEMA had signed on the dotted line. They stalled for, well, from 2009 up until 2013. They stalled four years and we argued them from every aspect that we could and we did not begin anything which allowed us to collect money from FEMA in order to pay for part of that uh, construction of that bridge. Uh, we continued uh, looking for new jobs into the community. Uh, most of you, as you drive on Highway 60, you see Lansing Elevator over there uh, east of Gray Ridge. MoDOT was doing work on exit and entrance for people to get to Lansing Elevator but they wouldn't do it unless there was a guarantee of a certain number of employees, which was 12. Today, Lansing has 19 full-time equivalent. That's not 19 full-time people, 19 full-time equivalent, because in the fall and maybe around wheat harvest time, they have extra employees, but it's to the tune of about 19 people. County Commission had to guarantee MoDOT that if those 12 people were not there, that the county would pay MoDOT back for all of that work that was done on the highway. We didn't risk any of your tax dollars because we then signed an agreement with Lansing 
that if they didn't have 12 full-time employees, they had to reimburse Stoddard County. So we didn't run any risk of, of tax dollars being having to be used for that. Uh, another operation that's getting ready to go into uh, use is down at Winchester Place, down in Bernie. They requested a facility back in 2016 to allow their residents, when they reached the point that they needed uh, help from an Alzheimer standpoint, they would have to leave Winchester Place, go to the one facility in Dexter that would handle them or go somewhere else. Uh, Bill Vansel came and asked us, will you write a letter of recommendation? And the commission did. That's gonna be 40 new jobs down there in that facility. Those are the things that we need to do from a standpoint of Stoddard County is to bring more work in more jobs in and we've done that the sheriff's department if you've seen any of the literature i've had out or anything you know that i'm in support of prop one and prop two i think the sheriff's department has done a pretty good job with what they've had available but we are in a situation that we need to correct some of our problems up there if we don't correct them we're going to wind up like New Madrid County, and we'll send our inmates somewhere else, and we'll pay out the money a million and a half a year, a million to whatever the negotiation can take place. If we pass it, then you've got to administer the money. You go back into my background, that's what I've done from a financial standpoint. I've worked with the money, with the budgeting, and that's the way we were able to control our expenditures in Stoddard County. They, the Sheriff's Department, the Collector, the Treasurer, the Assessor, all, all of these people submit a budget at the beginning of, well, I usually try to do it in December so we can have it done quickly in January. But they submit a budget. They don't always get that budget. If revenues, projected revenues, do not equal that, you can't pass that budget. You've got to turn around and start cutting. And I did that for 20-something years in, in the manufacturing realm. It's not an easy thing to do when somebody just says they have to have it, but you don't have the money, you've got to tell them no. And we've done that. The current commission has to do that every year. Because it seems like there's always more projected expenditures than there is projected income. Uh, questions about anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, when you were commissioned before, did you ever go in our jail, Sheriff's Office jail? Have you ever been in there? Did I ever go to the jail? Yes. I went over there before I started. I have gone over there since then. Uh, that was the first part. The second part is since you've been in our jail and you've had you're the only one that's been a commissioner before, correct? That's, um, that's correct. Why was nothing done until now that we're trying to get this done? When you were in there, how come nothing was ever done on that? Well, before I got there, they had a, a proposal on uh, a new jail, and the commissioners tabled it. After the four years that I was in there, we worked on the beginning of where you are now, of trying to do something. Temporarily, we sent uh, prisoners over to Mississippi County to try to alleviate the problem. Uh, that got to be a financial burden, and we had to bring them back. We sat down with the judges, the commissioners did, and went through every inmate that was in there. Could we temporarily release one of those people? And when we got through going through the list, the judges determined no. We could not allow one of them out to create a problem. But it, it takes some planning to do it correctly. And I think they got started with the planning. And we didn't have the 70, 80 people in there. We were running 60 to 68 people in uh, 2016. Prior to that, we were a little bit lower. So we had beds available, not to the extent of what uh, you needed inmates now, 
where you got the 80. So it wasn't as big a problem, it was the beginning stages. And we did work on trying to come up with a solution. Okay. When you say, and I'm sorry, but when you say beds available, it, you realize it's a 28 bed facility. We had mats available on the floor is what we're talking. There was extra mats available on the floor. There was no beds at 60, there's not any beds available. Well, you had more than, if I remember correctly, we had some bumps added in 2015 four or six, and I don't remember, because I had to go back to look at that. But at one point, didn't we have 44 beds in there all throughout? Not that I'm aware of, but Danny might answer that, but I don't believe yeah. I'm not sure on the actual bunks, uh, but when you talk to anyone about a jail, they go by what that jail was designed to house, which is 28. We can move 100 bunks in a day room. It doesn't change the size of that jail. It's still a 28 bed jail. Yeah. It, it, Andy's point, it's still, a, it's still the same size facility, but there were bunks in there so that not all of the inmates on the floor. I think we got it up to 44 at that one point, and we were at about 60 people in there, so it's not like what you have now with uh, right at 80. Other questions? Thank you. Next up is Mr. Sam Huey, Jr. Y'all know when you get older, you got to put some extra eyes on. I'm Sam Huey Jr. I've lived in this area, basically the same part of this county, pretty well all my life, except for a little bit of time. I was over in Springfield, Missouri, where I met my wife. We've been married 44 years. We've got, uh, I guess, three nice kids, since some of them sitting back here. Got seven grandkids. <clears throat> I worked for the USDA for over 40 years, where I still serve as an arbitrator on the arbitrating committee for the USDA and the Federal Meat Inspection Program. Uh, I've served on the count Stoddard County Ambulance since 1995. <clears throat> I've been a first responder since about 1998. Been on the fair board for over 30 years. Uh, I was there when the old fair board quit and the new fair board started. I've been a member of Sacred Heart Church, 4-H alumni and leader. I've helped to 4-H. I've been a member of the Young Farmers, Dexter JC alumni, fourth generation farmer. Well, I've got a couple of friends said I wasn't much of a farmer, but I did go out there and work. Uh, I was 19, I mean, pardon me, in 2013, I was the uh, Dexter Chamber Child Commerce Citizen of the Year. There wasn't very many people around doing anything that year, I guess. Anyway, so much for that. That's who I am. Uh, I retired. I went back to work. I work for a construction crew now. I've learned a lot about the infrastructures. Uh, I've lived on a gravel road all my life, so I know about potholes. I know that you know there's got to be something done sometimes. The new bridges that Danny talked about a while ago, we received one of them down to our house that was really dangerous. And uh, Mr. Rowland there has been over that when the combine felt like it was falling in. So that part, what, what I find, you know, I'm definitely for the jail. We need to do something. Our deputies, just like Andy had up there a while ago, they're coming to work for Dexter and getting the $5 dollars an hour rates. Folks, in Dexter, you got backup. They don't. The, uh, I think I need, you know, the support of the infrastructure within the county and uh, working on getting more business in the county. We're, you know, we're not depressed, but we're, we're low. The goal that I've got is to work together for the benefits of the employees and the community 
and that we will continue to work, continue to work with all parties involved in moving forward. Now, I am a little nervous up here. I don't know why. You guys know me, I can talk your leg off. Now, that's my ideas. Is there any questions? Yes, sir. About a $7.6 million tax bill that has to pretty well be managed through this uh, organization. And I just wonder how much experience in the financing that you might have and how well. Okay, well, as you all know, in 1985, the fair basically quit. There's a handful of us got together, started a new fair board, the one we got now. We went from nothing to what we got now. We give out scholarships, we give out $6,000 this year. We build buildings, we pay off our bills. I am very well experienced in that. On the ambulance board, we built, when I got on it, we had the small shed in Dexter. The outlying shed was rented property to where sometimes they had to walk, or not walk, they drove their vehicles for three blocks to pick up an hamlet at an existing firehouse. Through good taxation, spending of the taxation money, we saved enough and done enough to get four outstanding sheds here. We've been running the same four crews covering our county, which is the 10th largest county, I was kind of instrumental in that. We're getting ready to, we're, we're experimenting with putting on a fifth crew because of the run volume. When I got on, it was 2,800 runs that year. We're now way over 6,000 runs. Running the same four trucks. Four trucks, pardon me, I can't count either. Anyway, we're getting ready to put a fifth crew on. We're experimenting with it right now. We've got to be sure we can make it's $350,000 put on that extra crew to man it 24-7. The county needs it, but we're constantly working tax-wise with our tax money, with our other income, to be able to serve the county better. I'd like to serve the county as well as I do for the ambulance. Any other questions? If, if you if you're setting up here at commission level and you don't work with your count or your uh, cities then you're fighting each other if you don't work together you never get nothing done so I feel like that yes there's got to be a bridge there any other questions I have, I have one uh, no, I'm not answering you. Okay. Go ahead. Right, so Go ahead, David. Well, I don't know if the other uh, gentlemen who are running for commissioner, presiding commissioner, has everybody spoken? No. Not everybody had? Okay. Uh, my question was, I just kind of wanted your take. It's obviously been in the paper a lot. Uh, the take of what's what's been going on with the shelter workshop. I kind of wanted to know what, what your thoughts were about a shelter workshop. Uh, three of the four candidates have actually come out and looked at the shelter workshop. I just kind of wanted to get your opinion of it, kind of see where you stand on it, how you represent oh, us. You'll pay. Sorry. <laughs> no, I haven't mentioned this for that fact. I am the chairman of the, of the shelter workshop board too. We've been through a difficult time. We're getting better. We've solved a lot of problems. We've got to work together with the SB40 and the shelter board and we're, we're, we're making this bond work. Once it works, all it's gonna do is make it better for our clients. And that's what we're there for. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to thank you all.
And the last gentleman running for presiding commissioner, Mr. Brock Williams. Thank you very much for having me tonight. It's always a good sign when my wife runs out when they announce me. So, um, Just a little background on who I am. My name is Brock Williams. I was born and raised in Puxico, a lifelong resident of this county. Other than a brief amount of time when I went to Texas after I graduated college to go find a wife, but then I came back immediately after that. Um, just kind of with my background, I've got a business in Bloomfield, Missouri. I'm an insurance agent there. I've been there for over 12 years. Um, the reason I am running for county commissioner is because I want to give back to our county. Um, I was raised early on in life uh, having respect for people that run for office, but I don't think it's something that needs to be a career job. Um, and it wasn't, and I'm not looking for that. Uh, but I have experience from running a business, dealing with budgets and things like that. That it's an op I have an opportunity to give back to this community. Um, I'm not a big fan of. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Start over here. Um, part of the problems, and this is going with Devin's question you just asked. Part of the problems that I see with some of the things that have been going on in our county is communication with people. Um, there has not been good communication. There's been some different wedges that have been built with different groups, and I want to go past that. You know, there's no reason that we can't operate as adults in our county and communicate with each other. We're not always going to agree on everything. It just doesn't work that way. But we can at least come to resolutions to work what's best for the members of our county. Um, I want to see this county thrive. Um, I've lived in Puxico, I've lived in Bloomfield, I've lived in Dexter, I've got a business in Bloomfield, I've got friends and family all over this county. I want this county to succeed. And for us to do that, we've got to work together. And um, that's why I'm running for county commissioner. Uh, one of my favorite quotes out there is from Teddy Roosevelt, the best thing you can do is make the right decision, the second best thing you can make do is make the wrong decision, and the worst thing you can do is make no decision at all. So don't make the wrong decision, get out and vote, but make the right decision and brought the vote. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Where do you stand on the propositions one and two? So inherently, I am not a big fan of tax increases, but this is something that we do need. Um, about a month and a half ago, I went through and did a tour of the, the county, or the, yes, the county jail, and looked at the conditions there. It's a deteriorating facility. Um, they have done a very good job with what they have, but there's things, you, know, you saw from the pictures, like the hallway that has about this much room for people to get through. It's not safe. Um, you know, we've got people that we're asking to work in that environment that are making poverty level salary in not good working conditions. Um, the, it's something has to be done. I mean, we're at a point now where Years ago, something could have been done, but we're past that. So there's no reason to worry about the past. We've got to worry about what the future of this county is. And it is something that needs to be passed, and I'm in favor of it. Um, I do like the fact that it's on a sales tax basis. Um, it will not be on property taxes. It's, so we're dealing with people consumption. You know, if somebody wants to buy something, well, they deal with how much they're going to pay on taxes. They can work their budget to that. And, uh, but it is definitely something that needs to be done with it. Yes, sir. How do you feel on uh, Devin's question that he asked Mr. Huey with the Senate Bill 40 and the sheltered workshop? I have, I've, I'm one of the people that's been to the sheltered workshop. I've toured it. I've also been to the SB 40 facility. I'm not sure exactly what they're calling it, um, and toured that one also. I've talked with both sides on that. Um, it's a situation where over time there has been some wedges that have been, as I said a minute ago, that have been uh, put in place between some of the people working there and it's caused some strife between the SB40 board and the sheltered workshop. Um, where it really comes down to mattering is the clients that are working at the sheltered workshop. And, and that's what the focus needs to get back to because it's become a lot of uh, he said, she said, and things like that uh, on both sides. It, it not, it's not all the SB40 board's fault. It's not all the sheltered workshop's fault. But they need to come together and work together um, to take care of the clients that are working out there. Yes, sir. When, when you toured the sheltered workshop, did you think that it was unsafe? I did not feel it was unsafe. And um, the, the example, because I've had a few people that have asked me about that. Um, my first job out of college, I worked in Austin, Texas. That's when I was in Texas for about a year and a half. And I worked in grocery stores. And I was dealing in the back rooms of grocery stores and stuff. 
a lot of the, of the facilities you guys are dealing with were, was kind of like that because where they're doing breakdown of recycling and things like that, it looked very similar to the back stocks of grocery stores in Austin, Texas. Um, is it the cleanest environment? No, not really, but they're dealing with breaking down stuff. Now that's not the entire facility. I'm talking about where they're dealing with the recycling. Um, it's an older building, yes, but I felt it was very well maintained for what they're doing and for the age of it too. Thank you all. And because the uh, shelter workshop and the SB40 board was raised to all the people running for presiding commissioner, Jeff and Danny, do y'all want to come back up and comment on that? I've not toured either facility. I've only learned from the SB40 board and shelter workshop is what I've overheard at the commissioner's meeting about them not getting along. I'd like to, if I'm elected commissioner, I want to see both budgets. I want to see the SB40 budget. I want to be the, see the shelter workshop budget, for what money they ask for, where it's going, and how it's spent. So, I mean, like I said, I've not toured the facilities, and I've just gone off what I've heard at the commissioner's meeting. And I'd like to address one other question I forgot for Andy on his 50% salaries, I think the sheriff's office should keep at least 75 or 85% of the original budget they have now to put money back after the seven years to take care of the facility, or we're gonna be in the shape we are now. Any other questions? Danny? I haven't been out to see Devin's facility recently. Been out there years ago with uh, taking recycling stuff out. Uh, it wasn't unsafe back then. I wouldn't think that you've made it worse since you've been there. So uh, it, as far as the facility itself, it is older. And I do know that uh, funds were not made available to them on a regular basis to do and keep things up to date. Uh, having been in manufacturing and been around machines, I didn't see any safety violations when I've been out there. Uh, as far as Senate Bill 40 and Shelter Workshop, I kept trying in 2016 before I went off the commission to get the two boards to work together. Instead of pointing fingers at each other, which is what a lot of was being done, uh, get them to work together so that they could resolve the issues and get to the point of taking care of the clients. Those young men and women that are working out there that is their work that they look forward to go to on a daily basis like most of you look forward to getting up and going to work. That is theirs. And it's geared to what they're able to do. And with adults getting off away and becoming combatant instead of working together. And that's, that's gonna be the solution. I don't care what kind of money you try to throw at it until both of those boards are working together for the benefit of the people that are out there working at the workshop, you're still gonna have problems. But when the adults get to be adults and work together, we're all right with it. Uh, one of the things that uh, Jeff brought up about maintenance, one of the things that we did at Freed Hardeman University, I've been on that board 25 years, is we set aside funding every year for the maintenance of a new facility because it's going to wear out. You're going to have to replace air conditioning units. You're going to have to do minor repairs or major repairs eventually. If you set aside a certain amount of money each year toward that in the years when you're not doing anything, when you're not having to do maintenance, when that time hits, you've got the funding available. You don't have to turn around and go 
to try to figure out how you're going to get money or, or go out and ask for some type of an increase on uh, of taxes, you've done it properly through management. And that, to me, is the best approach. It's worked well for Freed Hardeman University to do that, is you can actually do repairs when they're needed and not put them off until they become a necessity for the existence of the facility. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sounds a little unfair, but you made the comment just a minute ago about you guys tried to get them to work together and they wouldn't work together. What's going to be different this go around if you were to get elected to make them work together? What's the difference of the, the how, how are you going to handle that this time that it couldn't get handled? Now, I'm saying you didn't handle it, but saying it didn't get handled last time. How are okay. you going to do well, that? Well, one, one of the things that's already happened with that is new board members have been appointed. Uh, we appointed some new board members in 2015 so that we would have unbiased people going in to where they would work together. Uh, through health issues, one had to resign. Uh, two others got converted over to the problem side, I think, where they were being very combative, and they continued in that vein. The current commission has gone in and put three new people in. Uh, I think one was added in, in 2017, maybe, which made a total of four new ones since I've left. And now things are working a whole lot better and that you've got people that's wanting to work together instead of being combative. And that's the way you change the, the makeup of a, a board. That's the way the commissioners can do it. Anything else? Yes, sir. Thank you for your time and service there. I think that I wonder how much time each one would have to take care of that business. And with Farm Bureau, we kept up with uh, what you all were doing, you know, when you were in. And I was well pleased that I thought things would be handled in an organized way. Okay, you're asking how much time would. Yes. Would so be how available? much time does that require? And if you've got other businesses and stuff, how, how will that interfere? Well, the general conception is commissioners only meet three hours a week. Well, <laughs> I, I realize there's more to it than that. But in reality, you're on call 24 hours a day. And the majority of the calls that I had when I was on as associate commissioner had to do with roads which the commission doesn't deal with. They deal with bridges of 19 feet or longer, but not the roads. So you still have to call the road district, talk to them, the special road district, or call the, the township who handles the roads, get the answer and get back to the person. Uh, one of the things I tried to do is go out and take a look personally, not just accept it over the phone that there's a problem, go out and look for yourself then you know the answer you're getting from the township, you know the answer uh, to give back to the person that called. It is a problem or it isn't a problem. And I, I'm in the position that I've got all the time in the world because I'm retired now. So uh, I don't have another job that requires uh, most of my time and I would only be devoting part of my time to it. I can devote as much time as needed to to perform the work of the presiding commissioner. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Sammy, Brock, do y'all have anything else y'all want like to say? Go ahead. In reference to the gentleman, I can't remember who it was, asked about the building site. As far as we're concerned, we don't care where this is built. We just want it built. My feeling is if, if you have an opinion on where you think it need to be, needs to be built, that's something that you need to address with the commission. We don't have control over where it's built. We just need a facility of some type built somewhere. That's, that's where we're at. I'm also retired. Yes, I do work in construction, but.
but I can not have to go in any day or any time that I don't have to. So I mean, you know, I'm retired, but me and my brother get farm, so it's all rented out. Other than having to listen to my wife, I can go anytime, anywhere. And as for me, I'm not retired, but I would like to be someday. But, uh, but uh, I'm an insurance agent, as I said, in Bloomfield, uh, which is where the county offices are, which is, I mean, if I was in a different part of the county, it would be different, but it gives me a lot of flexibility. Plus, I have staff in my office to assist with uh, times when I get out of there. So that has uh, all been discussed with uh, my family and also with staff before I even sign the I do all my own business, but I make my own schedule, and I work the hours I want to work. I have employees to take care of stuff if I'm not there. So I can donate as much time as I need. Get this one important question was like location. Yes. For security getting in the courthouse, the sheriff's office and all that. So you can't hardly put it way out of somewhere you're gonna be at the bus and people back. You covered it. It, it does create a problem. Yeah. It's not anything I am not gonna sit here and say that it can't be done. You need a secure place. So they can't Absolutely. escape between the courthouse and that area. It doesn't need to be a senior place. <laughs> but I just wanted that gentleman or anybody else to know, we're not dead set on building right where we're at. I think we're leaning building where we're at because of the other buildings are already there. It's the, the, the convenience part of it. Um, but again, if this thing's passed, if somebody's got some voices that wants to voice a, uh, an opinion on where it needs to be built, that's, that's what the commission meeting is for. The safety you and Chris, you know, everybody. The safety trying to get between court and there. You've even talked about maybe having a separate you know, entrance. Ab absolutely, Billy Pat. A lot of what people don't understand, our job is just not out here arresting people. The Sheriff's Department is also responsible for court security. All of those ladies and all of those judges over in the courthouse that's our responsibility. So having our office two buildings over is a lot more convenient than being on the outskirts of town. Again, we're not dead set on building any one certain place, but it sure is awful convenient where we're at. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody have any more questions for Paul? Oh. Okay, his, his question is, what's the tax thresh, threshold for Stoddard County? And I think when Prop 1 and 2 passes, we're there. Uh, because then we are bumping the same tax rate that is in the other counties or slightly higher that's right around us. And I think you've reached the point that you can't go for any more. And the good thing is, in Prop 2 drops off in seven years, so that you drop back down, not as low as we are now, but that puts you below some of the other counties around us. Uh, does that answer your, your question?
yes, we don't need any more taxes. I believe in that firmly. But when you go to a sales tax, if I spend a dollar, if you spend a hundred dollars, we're the same percentage. We're getting the same amount percentage wise. And then everybody that travels up down 25 and 60 that stops at Dexter Walmart or and not just picking on Walmart, the gas station, you know, the grocery store, or any of the other stores in Stoddard County, when they spend a dollar, they're going to help to fund our jails. So yes, there is a threshold, and yes, we're getting close to it. But you're better off, I think, with a sales tax than you'll ever be with a property tax. Because folks, I got a little bitty house and two old broke down cars, and let me tell you what, my personal taxes and property taxes are real estate just isn't like everybody else's. But we either go back 20 years or we look forward. That's my thought. Kind of, I think we're at the threshold. Um, this tax is going to definitely push us up. We're, I'm not exactly sure what all the rates are in the other counties, exactly what they are, but it's going to push us up to the same area that they're at. I don't, I don't like that. And I'm not for any more taxes coming forward from that. Um, this, if it wasn't for the Going forward with this, as I said, the past that's happened with our jail, getting into the condition that it's at now, something has to be done. Um, and it's not the way to raise money in a county is taxes, and uh, which is a I'm not for. And so, after the, other than this tax, I will not be for any other taxes in our county. I agree with Sam. Everybody goes up down 60 pays to set our sales tax. But you got to remember, we might be at our threshold. 4.2. 25% is state tax off the top. So that comes off the top, and then I think the counties is 1% or a little over 1%. So we're not paying a lot. We're paying 1% because the state comes off there first. Then you got the 911, and then you'll have proposition one and two. But we probably are at our threshold for our class, our county rating. And you just got to remember on that. I had to explain that to someone on Sunday. The county tax, the state tax comes off first, and we have no control over that. Any other questions? Yes, I'd like to ask this commissioner, as people are trying for commission, if for some reason Proposition 1 and 2 doesn't pass, what is your plan for taking care of the sheriff's office? Because whether it passes or not, we obviously have a problem that we're going to have to address and take care of. His, his question is, if Proposition 1 doesn't pass. No, 1 and 2. Well, 2 can pass, but if 1 doesn't, it's done. So it really rests on number 1 passing the, before you could consider 2. But if they both pass, now you've got the ability to get a jail. And as Andy talked about, a 120-bed facility uh, at $9 million, I think that's what you said. Okay. And in the seven years that that half percent's on, you come up with 9.8 million to pay that off in a seven year period of time. Or as Steve said, any additional funding, they may turn around and help pay it off earlier. If that doesn't pass, then we are in a position that our general revenue is not sufficient to go and build that facility. 
we're going to have to start doing repairs. We're going to have to start doing some form of reduction of people that's in there. And I know Andy and the, and, and the Sheriff's Department are not actively going out and looking for people to arrest because they have no facility for it. And the general revenue won't build it. The general revenue won't provide the funding that the Sheriff's Department needs today, salary-wise, or personnel-wise, if we tried to build a jail without Prop 1 and 2 passing. I understand that, but yeah. how are we going to address the problem? Because the problem's not going to go away after next Tuesday. We're still going to have 88, an average of 88 inmates yeah. up there. We're still going to be shorthanded on deputies making $11 an hour that they can go out here anywhere and work and not have somebody shooting at them, spitting at them, cussing at them. So what is our plan if it does not pass? I mean, Turn around and ask your current commissioners, but I, for me? I, I'm looking, we're trying to get a new voice in there okay. to lead something new because we've not done anything over the last few years to address this problem apparently because of the shape that we're in. Uh, the, the thing you can start doing is doing immediate repairs that need to be done as you have funds. I mean, without the funding, you're not going to go out and, and go spend $2 million or $9 million if you don't have the money, and the county does not have the excess funds to do that. What you can do is go and try to improve the conditions that you're in, whatever that may cost and whatever uh, Andy and Carl would say, we need to do this first, this second, and this third. Uh, to help alleviate the problem. But until you go and find a way to start reducing your level of inmates, you still got the problem, as you said, you got a facility that was made for 28 people that you're housing 80. We may have 44 beds, but that still, as Andy said, doesn't stop the situation. You've only got funding for or a facility for 28 inmates. That's all you can do with it, is slowly try to do that. And in the meantime, you can approach for grants. The last time we looked at grants in 2016, USDA didn't have anything that we could go after. There was not any big money out there to go and do a facility like this. Where would that money come from if we're already cutting our budget back? We give a budget to the you guys. You just may as well go. They give a budget, you all cut it back because there's not enough to go around. Yeah. Where's that going to come from? Uh, the only way it can come from is, is your sales tax revenue because that's what the general revenue is driven by in Stoddard County is the sales tax. What you pay in property tax doesn't go into general revenue. If you look at it, most of it's going to the schools. And the only thing you can start doing is trying to find where you can cut costs to free up a little bit of money to go in there. Either that or you go into reserves and do something there. And the county doesn't have huge reserves. They've, they've done pretty well over the years to build up some reserves, but there's not a huge amount in there that you can go and say, well, we'll do this facility on our own. Won't work. we're in the world of hurt big time but I think to go if it doesn't pass you need to go and I don't know who the county has does their grants the uh, Carol Steve who does the county's grants is that with Boot Hill Regional Planning yeah. okay we haven't approached her yet, but okay I would have somebody out there searching high and low for grants they're out there there's people that write grants every day the only grants are No, but I say there's some federal money out there, but you'd have to spend it to get it on the grants. But uh, I think the big thing, look for grants. The county, the present commission built the Justice Center and the uh, government building. Where did that money come from? So there's got to be money you put back to build stuff. I think Andy has some money put back for some remodeling uh, stuff. 
Well, you're going to have to take Kay's budget and everybody else's budget and shrink them down to see where you get that money. And then you're going to start making people mad when you take their money away. But I think the main thing is, is to look for grants. And there's grants out there. You just got to find them in the right position. I think Brent used to work there. Didn't. Uh, yeah, there's, there, is, there is no grant out there anywhere uh, for a jail. There, the government won't give you money for a jail. So that's the issue that the county's running. Right. But if it don't pass, the county's going to have to just beg and do what they can do. But you don't want to get any reserves, in my opinion. Because if you have a federal disaster, those reserves are for that. You have to dip in them to pay your people and keep things going. Anything else? Sammy? Getting our walking in tonight. Um, answer to your question, it's already been said with grants and things like that. Other options out there are dealing with business leaders in our area. You know, we, we do have some very successful businesses in our area. We're going to have to touch base with them and see if they would be willing to partner with the county and, and do things that need to be done. One thing I disagree with Daniel on, they've done repairs to the jail, but they're past the point of repairing some of the things that are there. Um, it's, it's in pretty bad shape in certain spots. Uh, in his presentation where he was talking about the glass windows and things like that. I mean, where that is located at is around, which blocks is that? Is that A and B block? A and B block. At a and B block. Um, it's just deteriorated. That's the reason the glass has been breaking and falling in. So, But there's only so much in repairs I can do with that without making a major renovation. There's not money for that. So other than the grants, like I said, dealing with partnering with business leaders out there that we've got in our county to, to help make our entire county safer for everybody. I mean, I've got two little children right here. I don't want them having to deal with criminals that are not being taken to jail that need to be in jail because we don't have the facility to hold them. And I'm not talking from a bed standpoint. I'm talking about from just a safety standpoint. Any other questions? Brock and I have turned to jail at the same time, and I think you can ask Andy if anybody wants to go through it. It'll take you let you look at it. And it's a sight to see. It does open your eyes when you go actually go through it. Um, I, I've seen the presentation, but actually seeing it, it, it does give you a different viewpoint of what what's going on in the jail. Well, like our other three gentlemen have said, this needs to pass. I understand what you're asking now. What we'd have to do as a commissioner, or as a group of commissioners, we would have to figure out where to start next. This is not an easy question to answer. The fact is, if this don't pass, whoever is the new presiding commissioner, which I said I'd like for it to be me, but that's side the point. Yeah, and I'm a clown, but anyway, some way they're going to have to find how to repair, how to add on, and how to do it. The easiest way to do it is with the tax. I'm against tax like I said a while ago. But the main thing is I'm also for the protection of our county citizens or anybody that comes through our county. Without this, we're in trouble. I had a situation on the farm that last is October or November. <clears throat> had a guy walking through my field like a nut, slapping his coat at the birds flying over. My wife called me. I was uptown. I couldn't get away for a minute. I called the sheriff's department. <clears throat> Their dispatcher made a mistake and told me he didn't have nobody. There was no way for anybody to get out there. I mentioned Highway Patrol, Dexter Police. I'm just outside the city limits. Well, I can't do that. Well, I know these guys. I made a call. I had a, a deputy there before I could get there. But if we don't do something, then we're in trouble. I can't protect my house 24-7. Nobody else can. And that becomes vigilante, and that's no good either. 
So we, you know, something will have to be done. If this isn't passed, then they will have to figure out a way, and that will be up to our three commissioners. Folks, I know we spent a lot of time on this, but this is a very important subject to the county. Does anybody have any further questions? Okay, if not, we're going to move on. Uh, our next uh, gentleman is Mr. Cecil Weeks. He's running for county clerk. I, too, would like to thank Farm Bureau for putting this on tonight. It's been very informative to a lot of us. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Cecil Weeks, and I'll tell you a little bit about my family and my, my job experiences that's brought me to this point. I married, of course, to Myra, used to be Myra Jolly, and also she was married to the late Neil Botch. We've been married 18 years. Between us, we have five children, and I'll name the five children because sometimes it helps to put families together so you know who's related to who. Uh, Tara Zeller, Brad Botch, Stephanie All, Amy Kirkran, and Ashley Beard. And we have 14 grandchildren. And I won't go into all naming all the grandchildren, but Meyer would be happy to help you with that later. What's brought me this long road to this point is my experiences in the past. I have served on, uh, as a uh, mayor, councilman, president of utility board, HR board, and the boards just go on, I could name that I've served on in the past. Uh, business experience over four decades in business, which came to an end last Friday when uh, I sold the business. Uh, I knew this was a full-time job and would take all of my time if I was fortunate enough to, to win. Uh, and I knew I needed a little time to prepare for it. So as of Friday, I no longer have a business that ties me down. I can devote full-time to this job. I'd like to ask for your vote in August and November do you have any questions? If not, thank you. Our next two gentlemen up are running for uh, state representative. Uh, first up is the, our current state representative, Mr. Herman Morris. Again, I'd like to echo what the other people have said and thank Farm Bureau for sponsoring this. I appreciate the opportunity. I thought we just had to make a couple of minutes statement to start with, and that's all I've got. But if it's 10 minutes, I can talk slowly. Uh, but anyway, uh, why you should vote for me. First of all, uh, I want to say that anything I say about myself is not meant to be a reflection on either of my opponents. I would like to think that I'm not a politician. I get a little flustered when people call me a politician. I know that's, you know, are you kidding me kind of stuff, but uh, by the same token, the uh, reason I say that, I didn't seek this office. I was asked by some people if I might be interested in throwing my hat in the ring. I came up with a list of objections why I might not want to do that, and they looked at them and said, well, those can be worked around. And so, you know, at a caucus last August, I was the one who was selected by the Republican Central Committee to run for this office as a Republican. Uh, in that regard, uh, I want you to know that I don't ask for money. I'm not a rich person, but I'm comfortable enough with what I have. The only time I asked for money was the last couple of weeks when I was trying to flesh out a golf tournament as a fundraiser. So if you see me any other time, it's not likely that I'm going to ask you for money. It's not like when your child calls home from college, the first thing you do is grab your wallet, hold on to it. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. If you see me somewhere and you want to tell me something or ask me something, uh, I sure don't mind you approaching me. Uh, 
I had someone tell me, say the other day that they came up to me in town and country and I acted like I had all day to talk to them. Well, I probably didn't have all day. But if you see me somewhere and you want to tell me something or ask me something, don't hesitate to do that. I'm willing to listen. I'm open to questions. I realize there's lots of things that I don't know anywhere near all there is to know about or even a whole lot about. But, you know, if you want to fill me in on that, if you want to talk to me about that or tell me your take on that, I'm certainly glad to listen. I'll be honest with you. Uh, people who know me, have known me for very long, say I'm trustworthy. I've been treasurer of about every organization that I've ever, ever been in. Uh, you know, if you look at my brochure, I managed the school credit union for over 19 years. Uh, but anyway, I've served one year in the legislature. I served on the Ag Policy Committee and on the Corrections and Public Institutions Committee. And I can say that I've learned a lot. It's not exactly like you read in the history books or in the civics books. It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, and I'd love to have the opportunity to go back and serve a full term. And if you have questions, here I am. Yes, sir. Everything we've talked about tonight until Cecil got up there has been about taxes. So I hate to bring this up about taxes. <laughs> but I'd like to know your feeling or opinion on the thought of state sales tax increase to do away with personal property tax. The reason I ask that is I'm out there in the workforce every day and there's fewer people working all the time. I understand. Everybody's looking, everybody's trying to find good help. Nobody wants to work. Well, if they don't work, they don't buy new cars, they don't buy boats, they don't buy anything else that they pay personal property tax on, but they all go shopping. Yeah. And, and the personal property tax people are supporting the people that don't care about bettering themselves. I, I'd just like to know your opinion on that. Okay. Well, along the lines of what you're talking about, I think nationally, there's 37 or 8 percent of the people who could be working who are not. They've either given up on finding a job or they just don't want to work. Uh, I introduced a bill that didn't get too much traction, but what I wanted to do when I went up to the legislature, I wanted to know how many people we had that were second, third, and fourth generation welfare recipients. And that, e that information does not exist. And so I filed a little bill that would address that. And it got heard in committee and that's about as far as it got. The other side wanted to throw some money at that and establish a commission to see why that would be the case. Uh, when they did the fiscals on that, one of the organizations that was involved, and none of the organizations that were involved in this, DFS or the other, any of the other ones, said that they needed more manpower. But one organization said to gather that information and prepare a report by 2022, which is what the bill called for, would cost somewhere between zero, nada, and a million dollars a year for three years to gather the information. Now, that, that was kind of a, well, I think the acronym for that's WAG. But um, anyway, getting back to your question, uh, and a, a related question has to do with internet sales tax. And that was brought up the last two or three years in the legislature, but not this year. And they were waiting with regards to whether or not there was a lawsuit that was going to be heard by the Supreme Court, Wayfair versus, I believe, South Dakota. If it weren't South Dakota, it was North Dakota. And one of those states, I believe South Dakota, was trying to tax Internet sales, which, you know, for us here in Southern County, you know, that's a good deal from the perspective that, you know, Amazon doesn't have a presence in this county or none of the other places where you can order online do. And, you know, you go downtown in towns in, these, in, my, in this district, it's my district right now, you go to Bell City, there's nothing. There's a couple of restaurants and a cotton gin and maybe a feed store, but that's about it. And our downtowns are drying up simply because People aren't spending money in town. They're spending money online. Maybe not so much in Stoddard County, but it's not uncommon. But your question had to do, would I favor uh, a sales tax? Now, repeat it again. The state sales tax increase that would do away with personal property tax. 
away with personal property tax statewide. I would imagine, you know, when discussions are held with regards to that and the, and the legislative change, you know, and the committees and whatnot, you know, probably about anything is on the table. You know, Republicans have an aversion, as many of you know, to raising taxes. Uh, Democrats, you know, love to raise taxes. You know, and I'm oversimplifying, obviously. But uh, anyway, you know, I I'm not opposed to something like that. A sales tax, the problem with it, as opposed to a property tax, is that, you know, it fluctuates with the economy. You know, if the economy's down, then there's not as many sales, there's not as much sales tax generated. A property tax is fairly predictable. You know, that, that's the advantage to it. Now, is it fair? Uh, in some respects it is, because, you know, people who own property in Stoddard County have a greater stake in Stoddard County than people who buy stuff. But, you know, uh, again, I, Oh, okay. Okay, I misunderstood. Vehicles, that. tractors, anything like that that we have to pay personal property tax on that the people who won't work don't have. Okay. But they still go shopping and, and they pay and they can pay sales. Tax. Yeah. But anyway, I'm I'm not opposed to anything. You know, I, I think you know we lowered the state income tax this year. We lowered the corporate rate. You know, and the thinking with regards to that is people knew how they wanted to spend their own money better than the state did, and lowered or corporate tax, you know, is theoretically attracts business, and hopefully that's the case. But as far as shuffling those things around, you know, I'm not opposed to, to any of that necessarily. Other questions? Surely you've got more than that. Would you uh, consider looking into something that would take the burden off the county for these inmates that are on uh, SSI, Medicare, Medicaid, that they well, can't... Well, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know that that was the issue. You know, obviously it is. Uh, and it's, it's interesting that it picks up again as soon as uh, they're, in car they're sentenced or whatnot. But I made a note on the back of this. I'm always looking for ideas of, you know, possible legislation. And, you know, there's some frivolous stuff up there and there's some serious stuff up there. Uh, but yeah, I'm not opposed to looking into that at all. It wouldn't seem to me why at least Medicaid, since that's funneled through the state, why that should stop. And I think too there's an issue in there with regards to the state doesn't always pay their bills in time with regards to, you know, when they have prisoners who are incarcerated locally. The state owes Stoddard County $200,000. Okay. So that's an issue as well. Yes, sir. Yes, that was what I was fixing to address. Stoddard County is in a quite a fine, as you know, for law enforcement. And I think the state owes us well over 200,000, and they're like 18, 19, 20 months behind. So the county taxpayers are having to pay for the state's, most of our warrants and most of our prisoners are on state charges, not Stoddard County charges. Okay. So when you go back, if you happen to win, we would appreciate a little nudge. Well. That, that would only seem fair. I mean, if you're, ha you're basically, it's just like our sending prisoners to Mississippi County, you know, some of whom escaped, as I remember, but, uh, and so they weren't looking after them too well. Uh, but, you know, they, they wouldn't have kept taking them if we hadn't, uh, if we had quit sending the money. You know, and we don't necessarily have a choice, I guess, with the state, but they ought to do better than that. I, I certainly agree with you there. Not just for the sake of agreeing, but, I mean, it doesn't seem fair not to. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, I got some. Yeah, I can tell you I've been endorsed by MSTA, the Teachers Association. You might expect that since I worked at school for 27 years. I've been endorsed by Missouri Right to Life. I'm opposed to abortion. Uh, I've been endorsed by Better Schools for Missouri, which is a consortium of uh, principals, elementary principals, secondary principals, superintendents, and the School Business Officers Association. Who knew? Uh, and by the Missouri Cattlemen's Association. Uh, I want to say that it's a humbling experience being the representative from this county, or from this district, as at least two people have pointed out. Stoddard County is the 10th largest county in Missouri. And the 151st, 51st district, which includes all of Stoddard County, 
but it also includes Chaffee, Oran, Perkins, Van Duzer, Crowder, Tanner, and Salcedo, and an adjacent territory, is 932 square miles of territory. The state of Rhode Island is 1,045. So this district's almost as big as Rhode Island. Now, if you think that's a big district, there's a fellow who lives in Salem. He represents Dent County, Shannon County, and Oregon County. You know, so that goes from Salem and includes all three of those counties all the way to the Arkansas line. And he might even have a little bit of Howell County. Um, but anyway, when I'm out and about driving around, you know, it's kind of mind-boggling still to consider that I represent all of you people because it is a big place. And as I said, I'm a conservative candidate. I'm not in favor of abortion. I'm not in favor of, you know, constricting rights to people to carry or to have guns or whatnot. You know, what the people in the city don't understand that, you know, we can pass a law like that but uh, I'm sure Andy would be at the first of the line wanting to go around to some of these places trying to get those guns. And, you know, if it's a safety issue, you know, there's people, some of you people wouldn't want someone coming and getting your gun, and you wouldn't give it to them if they did. So, you know, that to me is a, a non-starter. I'm pro-education, and, you know, I've, I grew up on a farm. My dad was a farmer, so he went broke doing it. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer, my great-grandfather was a farmer. My mother, and among her papers, my brother found a, a lease that dad and grandpa had signed in 1935 to farm out by Avery, 803 acres, and they had no tractors. They had nine men that lived on that farm, and they had 25 head of horses and mules, and they farmed 800-plus acres with that from 1929 until the end of the war. And so I feel like I have some understanding with regards to issues on farms. You know, it's one of the few businesses where you have no particular control on the price of your inputs, and you have no particular control on the price of what you sell your goods for, unless you book them in advance, and then you're, it's a crapshoot, and you don't know how much to book. <laughs> but anyway, you know, all that being said, I'd appreciate your vote in, on next week when I have no opposition in the primary, and, but I would certainly appreciate your vote in November. And let me say one other thing. I sometimes sense that people think, well, why didn't you come to our particular event or your particular situation? Invite me. In Devon, I haven't been to the sheltered workshop, but if you invite me, I'll come and see it. What about tomorrow afternoon? One o'clock? <laughs> okay. No, I'm serious. You know, I'm, I'm willing to get out and do stuff like that, but I don't like to impose myself upon people, and I don't like to interject my pe myself you know, when people don't expect me. So if you want me to see something or do something, invite me. One o'clock tomorrow? That's fine with me. Okay. Next up is former state senator, Mr. Jerry Howard. Thank you very much. Um, thank the Farm Bureau for this opportunity. It's been a long time uh, since I've had the opportunity uh, to address a bunch of farmers. And uh, matter of fact, uh, my beans need a drink today. It got a little bit of moisture out there, but I'll tell you what, all it did was settle the dust. But anyway, uh, they do need a drink. My uh, great-great-grandfather settled west of Jackson three miles in 1797 or 99, before the 1812 earthquake, and had 14 children. I've got a piece of Missouri. And I was in Cape Girardeau County. I moved here 40 years ago. My great-grandfather's buried up on, on Buckeye Creek, northwest of uh, Cape Girardeau. And my grandfather is buried at Oak Ridge, and my father's buried at Jackson. My mother's buried there. My wife 
passed in 15, and I'm a widow. But like the life insurance commercial says, <clears throat> I've been around a while. I've done a few things, and I've seen a few things, lots of things. I grew up in a rural farm home with parents that had experiences that were in the Depression firsthand. A father who made, had only a fourth grade education, but was a self-made man and a rugged individualist. As many others, I received one pair of shoes and two pairs of jeans, 14 denier, if you remember. And that's what the rule was at our school in Oak Ridge. My mother's favorite quote, waste not, want not, still guides me today. I take literally the views of our Missouri son and 33rd president of the United States, Harry S. Truman. And I believe he had respect for others, ideas. He had a belief in a deity and a Christian ethic. Created law for the greatest number of people. Compromised and provided positive outcomes for all our people. And when in danger, all logical assets were at his disposal. I was blessed by a loving mother and father, a father that caused me to spend a while just to understand his rugged individualist ways. I was first elected to office after a five-person primary and a general election. My primary included four very qualified candidates, Delmer Barks, Bob Barney, Robert S. Barney, and mo most recently retired appeals, circuit ju uh, appeals judge, Vernon Day, former state representative, and Neil Mansfield, a uh, sold farm uh, crop insurance, lived down here west of town. Really good people, every one of them, very good people. The primary was difficult, but I went broke following the primary and the general election because I only got $1,600 in contributions, which was fine. I had a wool suit to wear to the freshman tour, and it was pretty rough against a skin that was kind of shed because of a, a problem <laughs> after the election when you kind of go down and you lose that, or you go into a funk actually. Whether you win or lose, you always go into a funk. And I asked a local two-year uh, DO to give me something to help me out, to get me back up on my feet. And he gave me a shot, but it was a speed shot of some sort. I don't know what it was, but anyway, then he had to give me something to slow me down. <laughs> My heart was going like that, and I said, golly, you got I'm coming apart. Do something. So anyway, he did, and then I peeled off all my outer layer of skin, and, and Alan Christian had to give me a car to go to Jeff City in, which was unique, and never have forgot Alan Christian for that. He was a great man. When I was first elected to the House, I was in a unique position I became the deciding vote for Speaker of the House. And I saw firsthand how people who were not term limited could respond to the people in their district by creating support for laws and programs that helped them. And my freshman year, with the help of the Speaker, I was able to pass a grant bill that enabled cities, towns, sewer districts, and water districts to build their systems and enabled them to upgrade them as well. They got a $50,000 grant from, this, from the uh, natural resources, and then they were able to go to the Farmers Home Administration and borrow the rest of the money they need to put in their system, and then they could pay it back with their user fees. And at that time, 
there were quite a few communities that had no sewer and no water. After a number of years in the General Assembly, I saw then and I continue to believe the only function of government is to provide specific necessities for its people. And those necessities are enable the disabled, provide economic advantage for, to all of its citizens, to care for the indigent and elderly, provide education and benefit to all of our citizens by providing sustaining support, stability and crime-free communities for all to prosper within and use military force when necessary. And you can't do a crime-free community without taking care of your law enforcement and your jails. I believe we are our brother's keeper. I believe in basic constitutional concepts. That one particular is separation of church and state. In my years of service, I witnessed the same style of governing as today. Destroy the middle class and reward the wealthy. I do not subscribe to the proposition that school choice is a productive way to educate our citizens. The driving force for choice is prejudice and power over the populace and creates a privileged ruling class and choice promotes and substitutes a class society within a democratic society. In a charter or a choice school, your tax dollars follow that student, resulting in raising your taxes at the local level. And finally, I believe an office holder should listen to all opinions. As President Truman, I believe one should be truthful. And to paraphrase him, if a person cannot handle the truth, I can't help it. I believe that I never heard about fake news until about two and a half years ago, but I'm sure there was some. But the media investigated then, and most were caught and prosecuted. I believe in compromising for the greater good of the people you serve. And when law is created, it should serve a majority of the people. I believe that one who gives a life of service to his community should be admired and respected. Jack Matthews and myself, together with Governor Carnahan, were able to develop your Stoddard County Veterans Cemetery. Jack Matthews was put on the, on the <clears throat> Veterans Commission with Governor Carnahan's blessing. The economic development, Stoddard County Economic Development Group was developed as a result of a fee that I passed in the Senate in order to have a basis for developing economic development in our county. Now, as for accomplishments in agriculture, in my time in the Senate, I tried to pass the bills that would have allowed uh, various things to happen. One was to have variegated leaf hemp to be grown for an ag commodity. And according to Kiplinger's letter that I got today, Congress is now poised to remove the restrictions for non-toxicant hemp and define it as a ag a commodity. Many different products are available for use and manufacture from the plant and seed. As you may already know, diesel was first made from the seed of a hemp plant. I was able to create a special underground water district for Southeast Missouri, the Boot Hill, Missouri, um, and the Boot Hill as an abundant, and because we have an abundant water source, um, we needed some protection from um, EPA and so forth, and this law made it possible for our farmers to monitor and control the quality 
uh, and quantity of irrigation and that allows the district to input uh, also with the state water plan. I created an agricultural research district for Southeast Missouri. Research districts study problems unique to this region. We passed the Bold Weevil Eradication Bill. The act helps farmers join together to uniformly control and eradicate the Bold Weevil. Passed the Soil and Water Districts Bill, it gives us a commissioner in Southern Missouri, whereas before we only had two, they had three north and seven. We're able to create the agricultural research districts, the purple paint law. While I was chairman uh, of the Joint Commission on Wetlands, we were able to watch regulations that the EPA was putting out so that we would not have wetlands labeled um, wrongly. We established a budget item for the state budget for the rice breeder program and requested federal assistance for agriculture when resolutions were needed for emergency situations. We also <clears throat> requested the federal government to enforce existing trust laws and other efforts to assist farmers and help to create the Delta Regional Authority. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Say again, please say, please state the question accurately, please. I did not cast a vote to murder anyone. I cast a vote to oppose an unconstitutional bill. I am for the Constitution of the United States. I support the Constitution. Each of us, when we're sworn to office, have to support the Constitution, both the state and the federal Constitution. I did that and I was doing my duty when I opposed that unconstitutional bill. Do you regret that vote? No, I do not, because it was unconstitutional. Just as I opposed the bill in committee, that was unconstitutional regarding guns. I own an AR-15, and I am, have probably as many guns as anyone in this room. And I oppose abortion, but I am not going to vote for an unconstitutional bill. Any other questions? Thank you. Our last two ladies up here uh, do not have an opponent, but they are, we're going to give them just a couple of minutes. Uh, first up, Ms. Paula Yancey. She's running for uh, public administrator. Well, I don't really have speech, and it won't take me long. I'm Paula Yancey. I'm the current circuit clerk here in Stoddard County. I'm finishing up my first term, getting ready to, for the next one. And I just want to tell everyone I appreciate their support and uh, I've enjoyed my job so far. I look forward to continuing that. I have a great group of uh, ladies to work with and I can't ask for hardly anything else. Um, I appreciate the Farm Bureau for hosting this. I think it's been a good forum. And um, if anybody has any questions, um, just come up to the courthouse any day. <laughs> Don't bring a purse or a cell phone. <laughs> we do have good security. Thank you. Any and last but not least, uh, County Recorder, Ms. Kay Asbeck. 
I'm Kay, as was most of you know. I've been at the courthouse for some years now, and uh, I always enjoy my job. We see different people, um, and I appreciate all of your support that you all have given me in the past, and just to ask you that you continue to do that. Um, just anytime anybody needs anything, you call. We're glad to help. There's four of us girls in the office, so just call or come anytime. We're glad to help. Okay, does anybody have any further questions for anybody up here at the table? I'd just like to ask everybody at the table, uh, your property is How's everybody, who, who, I guess, for property is Well, thank you, gentlemen. Any other questions? Okay, Ms. Carol Gerald, would like uh, a couple of minutes to say, comment on uh, propositions one and two. I would just, uh, on behalf of the uh, commissioners of Stoddard County, Steve Jordan and presiding commissioner Greg Mathis, I would like to just say that we do support Proposition 1 and Proposition 2. I would also like to just say I, I'm thankful and thank you all for coming out tonight and listening. I believe this has been a great uh, question and answer session. Uh, I thank the Farm Bureau for always supporting Meet the Candidate every year, and most of all, the Church of Christ for allowing us to meet here. Um, I want to thank you all for, again, for electing me as your commissioner, District 2, to serve you. I truly have always tried to do my best and to give my best. Uh, through the years, there have been some easy decisions for us commissioners to make, and there have been some hard decisions for uh, us commissioners to make. And every decision made would usually have an impact on you, the citizens of Stoddard County. I, uh, I love Stoddard County. We have a great county and wonderful citizens. One of the uh, decisions that has been really hard for me to make is the Proposition 1 and Proposition 2 because no one likes the T-A-X word. Uh, it's not a popular word, loving word, and I don't like it, and I know you don't like it, but the facts stand for themselves. We have no other choice. Do I wish we did? Yes, I do. Do I wish we did not have crime? Absolutely. I could wish all day long, but the wishing does not change the facts. The facts are real. Crime is a fact, and it's not going away. Our jail is very old, much need of repair, and it's definitely not big enough. The Stoddard County deputies are trying their very best to keep our county safe. And they put their life on the line for all of us each and every day, each and every night. I thank them, I pray for them, and I appreciate what they do. But I also feel like I need to put actions behind my words. You know the old saying, Ed, you, you've heard it's uh, saying action speaks louder than words. So the action is I support Prop 1 and Prop 2. I want better pay for our deputies. I want them all to have better equipment to keep them safe. I want them to have better maintenance um, and whatever they need, I am all for, along with Commissioner Jordan and Commissioner Mathis, for them to have. Prop 2 speaks to the safety of everyone. I wish we did not again have crime, but we do, and sadly, it is getting worse. When I first came on as a commissioner, we probably ran around 50, 60. If we got 65, we were like, you know, wow. I too have toured the jail many times. I've seen the conditions therein. 
I do not know how they cook meals in that kitchen. I, I truly do not know. Um, I've been in there when they were trying to book someone. It's not safe. The reason I was there, I did ladies ministries for approximately 15 years. So there would be times that a group of us ladies would walk in and have to pass by somebody that was chained or handcuffed to a chair, and it's not a good feeling. Um, the jail, again, is in much need of repair, and uh, we're in desperate need of beds, but also we're in desperate need for safety issues for everyone involved. I urge everyone to think about this Proposition 1 and Proposition 2, pray about it, and if you feel like you need more information from the commissioners, please call us or come by on a Monday morning from 9 o'clock, from 9 a.m. we start. We will stay there until you get the answers you need. You are welcome to look at the budget for the sheriff's office. You're welcome to come by the jail. I know Deputy, um, Deputy here and Andy will be happy to, to show you around. I feel like we are being very transparent and we're open about this and we're communicating to the public the facts, the facts to you. We're not trying to put out fear tactics or putting a guilt trip on anyone. The facts stand 